This is ENP Reports from Editor and Publisher Magazine, the authoritative voice of news media since 1884, serving newspapers, broadcasts, digital, and all multimedia news publishing. And hi, once again, Mike Blinder, publisher of ENP Quick Housekeeping. If you are listening to us on a podcast channel, whatever flavor you like, please follow us. If you're watching us on the YouTube channel, there is a subscribe button below. Hit the bell to the right of that. After you subscribe, you'll get an update each and every time we upload a new episode of ENP Reports, making her do debut of appearance on our on our series as my co-publisher, our um, vice president of editorial and the business partner I've had in my life for close to 25 years, Robin Blinder. Robin, you're joining us for a very special reason because the gentleman who is joining us, Mr. Peter Font, had reached out to you to ask a very important question we're going to get to in a moment. But Peter, uh, you are Peter Funt. You are famous because you have a Wikipedia page, sir. And I don't know if you've ever read it or seen it, but it, this is what the lead is. And we all know how important a lead is. Peter Funt is an American actor, host, and producer of the hit TV show, Candid Camera. That is true. He worked, and it leads with Denver. Denver radio station, KHOW. Mentions the ABC radio network, the New York Times. Yeah, bro, well, Mike. Yes. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how that happened because I don't, you know, I, I never dreamed of making my own Wikipedia page. I'm kind of a private, public person. But a few years ago, I was giving a speech at my alma mater, the University of Denver. Okay. And so, in advance of my visit, the journalism professor thought it would be a wonderful idea to assign the class to write Peter Funt's Wikipedia page. So they all, they all took a crack at it. And of course, right up there at the top, the University of Denver newspaper, why not? <laughs> so the DU Clarion gets into the first paragraph. Of, we're gonna get to all this. Peter's life, his the writing he's doing now for various publications. And of course, we gotta talk about Candid Camera. We'll get to all that right after this. This episode of ENP Reports is sponsored by IQ Audience Plus by Town News. Consumer revenue has never been more important. Digital leaders at media organizations worldwide are asking the same question. How do we accelerate the growth of consumer revenue? Traditional one-size-fits-all paywalls aren't the answer. They're blunt instruments that treat all visitors the same way, costing you money. IQ Audience Plus by Town News is a smart, dynamic metering solution that empowers you to maximize revenue by identifying key audiences, seeding engagement, and growing membership and subscriptions. Ready to supercharge your consumer revenue, grow engagement, and bolster your advertising income? Visit townnews.com backslash EP today to learn more about IQ Audience Plus by Town News. All right, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. The reason you're joining us is not just because you're a famous author and an amazingly successful, like I'm blowing smoke, I know, but you actually penned a story about the last of the afternoon papers published on April 20th. It hit the Wall Street Journal. It quoted someone named Robin Blinder. That's the my wife. And we were getting emails and, and calls and people were, were, were copying it all to say that Robin was famous for one sentence in your article. So first of all, Robin, now she's she can get her own Wikipedia page, thanks to you. But this was, this was a fascinating story. It was about the last of the afternoon newspapers. What motivated you to do that, sir? Well, it's, and it's really kind of a sad story. Now, the column you're referring to is in the Wall Street Journal. I write about 15 columns a year for the journal, but they're all about offbeat topics. I can't write about politics because the, their editors and I simply don't agree on <laughs> political things. But I write about human interest topics and media. I, I do like to focus on media. And a few weeks ago, I made it my own project to try to see if there were any PM papers, afternoon papers remaining in America. And now my definition of that type of paper is one that would be printed afternoon and distributed that same afternoon. That's a real afternoon paper. And so as part of my research, we contacted your company 
And Robin was kind enough to say something along the lines, well, we don't know of any such papers remaining in America. So to be certain about that, I checked further with the, uh, now help me with the name, North American Newspaper Alliance, or what are they called now? It's now called the News Media Alliance because you can't say the word paper, just kidding. So it used to be the Newspaper Association of America, not News Media Alliance. So you contacted them and they told you to do what? They, 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 they said, we don't have any, any such papers <laughs> that we know of but you ought to contact Pew Research in Florida. Yeah. So I did. And they said, well, we don't know of any such papers, but the Alliance would know, <laughs> talk to them. <laughs> so I thought, well, this is a zero, but I better look more carefully on my own. I finally turned up two newspapers co-owned in Montana. One is called the Livingston Enterprise, mm -hmm. and the other is the Mile City Star. And yes, they both still to this day uh, have a 2.30 p.m. press time and distribute the paper to homes at least by 5 or 6 p.m. that afternoon. So there I had it. And uh, it, it was a fun project. But very sad for me because I, I hate the fact that there are no such papers remaining. Let me say, uh, in the interest of honesty, I, to this day, subscribe to and get delivered to my driveway six printed newspapers every morning. So uh, that just confirms that I, I love the feel of a printed newspaper. And I hate the fact that they're disappearing as quickly as they are. And when it comes to afternoon papers, which as recently as four decades ago, considerably outnumbered morning papers, today, at least as far as I can tell, there are two tiny papers in Montana remaining, and that's it. And if anyone read the article, you would actually see that one of the reasons that John Sullivan, he was the uh, publisher owner that you spoke to, he said, uh, I couldn't get carriers at 20 below zero to, to, to deliver the morning edition in Montana in the winter. But it was a great story. You've written others for the journal as well that seem to be fun. I mean, I know you don't agree with their politics, but I think you, you know, how about that rollover Kierkegaard? It's all existential. Was that for the Wall Street Journal as well? A guy who never forgets. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of riffing on the word existential, you know, a perfectly <laughs> good word until the 4,000th writer uses it. And then we really wonder, is everything an existential threat nowadays? Apparently so. That's all we have. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, welcome to editor and publisher. Um, we have a lot of questions we want to ask you about media uh, before we're done with this journey together. But I think the first thing I'd like to know more about is your dad and you. And, and, uh, and for those that are under 40, I'm 65. I remember Candid Camera. It was a, an amazing yeah. show on television. Robin, you remember watching it with your dad as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that was Alan Funk, your father. Your debut on the show was when, sir? I think I read something about this. Did you? I was age three at the time. <laughs> Candid Camera had just begun. And my dad thought he'd send me out on the street corner in New York City with a shoe shine box and asked me to charge $10 per shoe. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know what the humor was supposed to be, except to see the reaction of some hard-boiled business people to this audacious young entrepreneur who could barely hold the shoe shine box. But you know what the sad part is? They didn't ever think to save the shows back then. Same oh. thing happened at same thing happened at Johnny Carson. You know, the first 10 years of The Tonight Show no longer exist because NBC didn't think it mattered, so they recorded over the tape. Back in my dad's day, he just didn't even think to save the film. It, he never dreamed that so many years in the future we'd be sitting here talking about it and maybe wishing we could look back on that. But 
So it's gone, but I have the family memories. That was my baptism of fire on Candid Camera. And I worked on the show on and off through school. And, you right. know, my dad, my dad was my idol. So I, I had fun uh, trying to follow in his footsteps. Finally, many, many years later, I took over the show and did a series on CBS and another series on cable and another series on TV land. So I've done plenty of candid camera, but I would note happily that coming up this summer is the 75th anniversary of the candid show. Oh, candid wow. microphone began on radio. My dad's original thought, a radio show, that began in June of 1947. The following year went to TV. So this summer is the 75th anniversary of the whole thing. And I'm proud to be releasing a documentary that I made about my dad. Uh, it's called Mr. Candid Camera. Wonderful. And it's a doc about Alan Funt. And it's being released on Father's Day uh, this June. Wow. I, Robin, you have a question about that? Yeah, I actually <laughs> I actually thought it was interesting because I didn't know that it started out as Candid Microphone and then a year later went to Candid Camera. And I don't know where I read it, but I read it. Uh, candid Camera was considered the the first reality TV show. So I probably I wrote that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my question. How, what do you think of reality TV today? <laughs> OK. So Very I, I have uh, many strange distinctions relating to my work and con contribution to the New York Times. I've written for them and blah, blah, blah. But one of the distinctions is I was once honored to have uttered what they call the quotation of the day. Ooh. So this was memorialized. The most important thing said in a, in a given day was something I said to a reporter for the New York Times. And in answer to your question, what I said was, it makes me very sad to find myself in the cesspool that has become <laughs> reality TV. <laughs> All um, right, in, in a nutshell. <laughs> Peter, Peter, don't hold back. How do you really feel? <laughs> that's, that's, quite, that's quite a quote. And I, I'm going to try to pull that out and make that our quote of the day, maybe for tomorrow. But your, um, your, your career was very interesting when it came to, to writing books. You have written a number of books, but you had an interesting uh, take on what happened during uh, COVID-19. That you, you started writing the book that just came out with. We want to ask you some questions about that. Yeah. But as you were reaching out to other people, of noteworthy people, what was this phenomena that you kind of came across about? Book I writing? thought I was so clever. You know, here I am sheltering at home. This is a couple of years ago, the start of the pandemic. We can't work. Our live stage shows were canceled. Our upcoming Candid Camera production deal was postponed. And so I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll finally write my memoir. What a great use of my time. And I got into it. And as I did, sl slowly but surely, I discovered that just about everyone I know was writing a memoir and plenty of people I don't know. I mean, I'd call up, I called up someone at CNN for some backstory. And she said, oh, I just got off the phone with Katie Couric. She's writing her memoir. And then, oh, okay. And then I, call, I called my friend Lucy Arnez, L Lucille Ball's daughter, for a quote for the book. And she said, oh, I, you know, I'm just sitting here in uh, Palm Springs writing my memoir. <laughs> I said, isn't that great? I called up my, my agent and said, what do I do? There's so many memoirs coming out now. And he said, well, I was kind of going to call you for your help because I wondered if you could take a look at the proposal for my memoir. <laughs> it's almost finished. So there are a lot of memoirs. So I'm, a, I'm a more than ever. So what I do, I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal about a plethora of memoirs flooding the market. That's how I do it. 
and yours is called Self Amused, a Tell Some Memoir. What is what is the the book just came out last year, right? And, and yeah, but late last year. I uh, first of all, I'm not uh, as I said earlier. I'm a kind of private, and so I, I the last thing I'd want to do is a tell all <laughs> memoir. So I thought, well, I'd tell some, you know, and that would work. But then that agent of mine pointed out, this is very shrewd, Peter, because if it's successful and you write a follow up, you won't have given away all the good stuff. So that's it. Self-amused, a tell some memoir. And it's available at Amazon or Barnes and Noble, wherever you buy books. What it was dedicated to your mom? Is that is? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, and she. She was a, a supporter and a fan. And, you know, so much is written and said about my dad appropriately. Very little about Evelyn Funt, who was just about the nicest human being I knew in my life. And so I dedicated it to my mom. And I believe <laughs> you're challenging me now, but I, I think I wrote in the dedication that she was a supporter of mine ever since I wrote an essay for school uh, in, the, in grade school for which I got an A grade, which was unusual for me. And she was so pleased. And the next morning I looked at the manuscript and realized that on the back she had written a quarter pound bologna, two cucumbers, <laughs> a loaf of bread. <laughs> She was scribbling her grocery list on the back of my essay. <laughs> Love you, mom. <laughs> well, she didn't let you get too full of yourself. That's she wanted it. to make sure that. Did, did, with, your, with your father being a television star, did you have a normal upbringing? I guess I should ask, or was it, was it abnormal? What, what was yeah, your upbringing? Here, well, uh, I don't know about normal, but here's the thing, everyone assumes that my home life growing up must have been just one big practical joke, you know, whoopee cushions on the <laughs> chairs and dribble glasses at the dinner table. And it really couldn't have been further from the truth, thank goodness, because my dad was not a practical joker. That's the funny thing. Wow. For him, candid camera was a means toward an end. And the end was, to study human nature. And that's what he cared about. And not to get too highfalutin about this, because it was a primetime entertainment show and comedy was a central ingredient. But what my dad relished was the chance to see how people react when they don't know they're being observed, and then to compare and contrast how different people might react to the same situation. It's amazing study in psychology. Um, you sent us, I, I, somewhere I heard that you were a subscriber to editor and publisher at a young age, is that true? I mean, did we have you as a subscriber back then? Age 10, age 10, I, I, I may have been your youngest subscriber. <laughs> My parents got me a subscription to the weekly magazine that came to our house. And then once each year at Christmas, they bought me the thick editor and publisher annual. Uh, this was wow. a directory of basically every newspaper in America. We still publish and, it. We still publish the darn thing. We, that's you, you, oh, good for yeah. you. Oh, that's well. what I went to to check for the afternoon dailies. We didn't well, here's this 10-year-old. Here's this 10-year-old in Westchester County, New York who's get this thing under the Christmas tree and can't wait to go through it uh, because it told everything about all the papers. And what I did was I wrote by hand to as many of them as I could, spent the whole following year doing this, asking for stuff like uh, a copy of the paper, of course, but any booklets or brochures that they might publish. And then something that became a great collection for me, I asked for a paper mache mat of their front page. Uh, now, back in the, in the hot type days, this was a stage in the printing process where this actual size paper mache 
mat was made. And then the, the metal printing plate was made after which the mat was useless and thrown out. So I asked them to send it to me. And every day, practically at our house, these big cardboard boxes were arriving. Well, they were so happy to send this kid this stuff. And that's what I did. Well, let me, first of all, we operate <laughs> now out of our home in Tampa, Florida. Robin, I'm going to ask you to do a visual, although three quarters of our audience is, is, is audio only. Would you walk into our dining room behind you, please? I see you're in our kitchen right now with your uh -huh. computer, because I want you to show him what we're going to mail him and what we have in our dining room, if you don't mind. Let me just go, let me just go get one. Okay. We, we have boxes of the published book we call the data book. We have stopped up in there. We have about <laughs> still do that. Up. And we're going to send you one for $4.75, please. Now, that's what we charge for it. I, I think she's pulling one out of the box now. So here you go. It weighs, what, Robin, about 10 pounds each. Would you like one of those as a personal gift for us? Oh, my gosh. And, what and a Peter, dream. I will personally be mailing it to you because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will mail you a complimentary copy of Self Amused. And I'll consider myself ahead of the game. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What is this yeah, about? That's exciting. How do, so back back when you were 10 years old, did you know you wanted to be a journalist? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I tried to skew everything I had to do for school all the way through high school and college toward journalism. So in in science in 10th grade. He had to do a project and a paper. And I somehow persuaded the science teacher that mine could be how newspapers are printed. Now, you know, most of the kids were doing astronomy or I don't know, uh, complicated scientific stuff. I went newspapers all the time. That's wow. great. What about this thing at the New York Times? Uh, how many different jobs did you perform for the New York Times? Well, here's the thing, and I'm glad you're giving me a chance to tell this to the public. I don't know if the New York Times has what could be called a Hall of Fame or a Hall of Records, but <laughs> if they do, I should be in there, and I'll tell you why. So, first of all, all my life, all my adult life, I've been a reader of the New York Times. Okay, that doesn't make me particularly special, so we'll move on. For 10 or 12 years early in my career, I wrote feature articles for the Times Arts and Leisure section about movies and television. Okay, that cuts dramatically the universe of people like me. Decades after that, I became an op-ed columnist for the Times and wrote opinion pieces uh, on various topics. So, okay, the combination of those things, get narrowing things down a bit here, but wait, there's more. There was the time when I was the quoted person of the day, as I mentioned, so that, that, that we're getting pretty rarefied there. But on three separate occasions, the Times interviewed me and profiled me in the paper. But they were writing about television, the guy on candid camera. I don't even think they knew or bothered to think <laughs> that I was writing for the paper at the same time in a different section. That's how big the New York Times is. A different floor, I mean, they didn't. <laughs> okay, so they, they profiled me three times, right? But, what none of them knew was that in my 20s, their circulation department hired me to start their vending machine business in Westchester County, New York. And I got up at three o'clock every morning to put the New York Times in vending machines. I did this for years because I couldn't earn enough as a freelance writer because the New York Times wasn't paying me enough as a writer, but they paid me more to put the papers in the vending machine. Now, I also, to make even more money, sometimes sold the paper 
standing in front of restaurants or bars, hawking the paper. <laughs> and here, here is the final distinction that I believe makes me unique. There were several occasions when I sold a person a copy of the New York Times, often got a tip, <clears throat> and that person had no idea that in that paper was a bylined article by me, the person who sold them the paper. I'm also certain that no one at the Times knows any of this stuff or cares, but uh, <laughs> there, there you go. go. Who knows? This could be their next profile. You never know. The Hall of Fame of the New York Times, you'd be the first one. And what is this about um, editing and publishing one of the most unusual print dailies in America? What, what, did, what is the story about it was called. It was called Newsmat. And this was a business that I invented in the late 1970s in my desperate attempt to be a journalist. Okay. And what it was, was a daily paper new, uh, a restaurant placemat with the news printed on it. Now, I mean, I wish I had one here because I did this a regular display could easily be mistaken for a daily paper anywhere in America with the headlines and text and justified type and photos, everything. But it was only for restaurants to use as a placemat. Came out six days a week. I was about to say, so wrote, it, was timely, it was timely news. You printed it every day and distributed it. Oh, directly. you betcha. The, the press run was at 8 a.m., I got up again at three or four to start writing it. And it was run at eight. Then I had people who delivered it to the restaurant. So it was there by lunchtime. And this went on six days a week. Well, I loved it. But the, the mistake I made was one that I made repeatedly throughout my career. I was too interested in the product, the journalism in this case, and not much in the business side. So where I should have been spending time selling advertising, which went on the border of this thing and was to pay for it, I was devoting all my time, energy, and staff to covering news. We were covering local press conferences and stuff then that, that didn't work as a business, but here is a, a lesson for journalists. I can't tell you the number of publications, including at the top of the list, the Wall Street Journal, that wrote glowing things about this marvelous entrepreneurial venture called Newsmat, except they never bothered to ask or find out if I was making any money, which I was not. <laughs> it was portrayed as a success because of its novel approach. But those are not really can, dots that connect. It was a novel approach and one that was losing all my money. It actually is not a bad idea if you think about it. I here's, mean, what, here's, how it here's how it finally ended after five years. McDonald's told me that they would like to take it exclusively for their restaurants. Uh, they call it a tray liner, not a... Um, <clears throat> placemat, but it, it's same size thing. I would change it slightly to be called McDonald's Daily Report, which I did, and put the little arches up in the corner, which I did. But other than that, I had complete editorial freedom. And they conducted a one-month test at 15 McDonald's in New York City. And uh, the test was, was a tremendous success. We would go in there later in the day, just watching people fascinated by this thing on their tray. And at the end of the test, McDonald's said, yeah, you know, we're going to go a different direction. There's a guy in New Jersey who's willing to print the placemats once a month instead of every day. So it's kind of cheaper. And he's going to put on their movie listings or something. <laughs> And that was the end of Newsman. And there you go, you, from daily news to, to a monthly publication. I think you just summed up where the print industry is today. 
what I would do, ask, I think Robin and I both want to ask you about your opinion more on a, on a more harder topic of where you believe journalism is today. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have an opinion, but I mean, one of the things that Robin and when we took over ENP um, just two and a half years ago, um, we didn't do it to make money. To be, we are one of the jokes we do. We're about to, we do a lot of conferences. Is well, what's all this talk about nonprofit journalism? The blinders have yet to get a profit out of this thing. We did it for our love of the industry and especially to support local journalism, which I hope you agree with me as a need in a Madisonian democracy, that final, you know, truth to power and whatever you want to, you know, label it. In, a, in the world of news today, and you're a news consumer, sir, you, 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 you read six newspapers a day, plus I'm sure you consume other news via internet, uh, cable, what have you. The six are just the home delivered copies. I have many more it, uh, subscriptions to digital forms, sure. So what do you feel about where the industry is today, the news world and the, and what we're doing with journalism? So you're, you're getting really serious on me. It's something I'm, I'm very interested in, but it's not a short answer, Mike and, and Robin. First of all, I think that you mentioned nonprofit. Maybe there is some kind of future that will help journalism with nonprofits. I mean, it, it has worked over the years to some extent in public radio. It's not, I mean, NPR is one of the best news organizations in the country and, and PBS on television. So maybe there is an equivalent in the newspaper world that could be helpful. There's also the possibility of more and more zillionaires operating newspapers, that would at least help keep them alive. Uh, I'm not so sure that's my favorite approach. But then again, I admire what Jeff Bezos has done to help the Washington Post so that that's fine. And Warren Buffett, I might add, and, and other very, very rich people. I think what America can't afford to lose are the very biggest papers and the smallest papers. I hate to say this on behalf of all those papers in the middle when I, because they're, they, they don't want to fade away, but actually the regional so-called Metro dailies might be the things we need least going forward. We are dependent on the biggest national papers, the, Times, Journal, USA Today, Washington Post, et cetera. And we are critically in need of the most local dailies that cover everything from the school board to the little league and everything in between, which if it weren't for them is just not getting reported. And that's very dangerous. That is real because that is something, I think that is a disease, a disease of uh, m not misinformation, but non-information that actually goes from the bottom up. If you don't know about your town and you don't know about your local government, you lose interest and connection with everything above it. And pretty soon we have a population that uh, is not only uh, underinformed, but I think vulnerable to the m misinformation, or, you know, as Trump famously and incorrectly labeled it, fake news, uh, because he was talking about the funny thing, Trump, of course, was talking about the correct news and calling it fake. But at the very same time, there's a grave danger about what is actually fake news, and you know the perpetrators from Fox to uh, uh, Drudge and all over the place. So that's my, that's my take. Now, to try to find the most positive thing I could say, perhaps for some of your uh, readers and listeners, it seems to me that this is one of the most uh, fortunate times for people who want to enter the business of journalism, particularly newspapers or their online expressions of news gathering. 
I am stunned when I look at the classified ads for small dailies around the US who are willing to take in now, if they can find them, journalists who, who have never worked at a paper, just want to work for very little. Those jobs are going begging all over the map. My own local daily here in Monterey County, California, keeps running a, a display, a classified display that says, come right for the Herald. Uh, you don't have to have ever worked at a paper, nor do you have to have a journalism degree. Now, that's scary on some levels, but when you look at it from the vantage point of young people seeking a, a, a job or a career, this is a very good time because that exists all, all around the country. You won't be very well paid and you'll work your tail off, but uh, why wouldn't you wanna do that to get a start in journalism. So we're in a very, very strange period. Mike, does that answer your question? I'm just curious if that was a gut or was that based on research? Because you summed up a lot of the things that we report on. I'm, I'm quite eloquent. I'm embarrassed to say I don't read you often enough. So no, that's just there, there off, is the, off the top of my head, but you know, great minds and <laughs> uh -oh. Or a thousand monkeys in a room with a thousand typewriters will come up with a Shakespearean play eventually. But there is research that backs everything you said. When a town's, a small community's paper folds, the community starts to, to wane and die. Their people become less interested in politics. They don't vote. They don't act. And, and the local business community starts to um, compress. Uh, another thing that is fascinating that I thought you were going to lead into, yes, there's plenty of work for journalists right now, plenty of work for anybody right now. We have a supply and demand issue. It's also a good time for entrepreneurs to be looking to take over some of these titles now. Um, you mentioned Warren Buffett, who had a famous quote, when people are fearful, be greedy. When people are greedy, be fearful. Now is a good time to invest in some of these small, because the price is growing. Might be a good time to enter the industry. We're going to have to bring this thing home soon, Robin, because the snarky people say I go too long on these things. They say <laughs> these interviews should only be 20 minutes. We go for 40 or 50. What is what final things would you like to ask, Mr. Uh, Mr. Well, Funk? I think I think, Peter, your crystal ball, whatever crystal ball you pulled that out of was pretty amazing. Um, I do. You, what do you see for the future? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I, as, as far as you're concerned, print had better not go away, right? Well, no, I, I put it this way. The future is digital. Oh, I'm long past the point of fantasizing that too many, if any, print newspapers will survive through my grandchildren's lives. So it's got to be digital. But they, they, there's still a lot to be done to figure out the economics of it because, yeah, again, if you're the New York Times, you can probably make it, they are making it work, even as a digital equation without the print side. But many, if not most, newspapers around the country are finding that they can't charge enough for the digital advertising to support the type of journalism that they had come to deliver in the print version. And so the equation is messed up. And I, I don't think it's impossible to f fix or figure out. Uh, and when I figure it out, I'll get back to you. That's awesome. <laughs> Peter Funk, author of Self Amused, A Tell Some Memoir. Uh, this book is available, just Google it and you'll find it everywhere. And I think if I may be so bold, sir, your official website, I did, you know, obviously stalk you before this and searched you, is Candid Camera, correct? You said you post everything there, people can contact you. Oh, yeah, candidcamera.com is the main location. All of, my, almost all of my newspaper columns are archived there, if you click deep enough. And, um, and our YouTube channel, which is something we're quite proud of, has an awful lot of Candid Camera favorites from over the decades. That's on YouTube, it's called Candid Camera Classics, and then the sister channel is Candid Camera Gold. So there you go. Thank you so much for your valuable time. This has been a, 
a wonderful uh, exchange of, 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 of fun and of, of, of good information as well. But moreover, um, may we please send you editor and publisher magazine now? Would that, would that be okay? Would you, would you find it time to hold a printed magazine at least once a month and give us your feedback on how we're doing? Because we'd be honored to have you as a subscriber, sir. We will start you on our sub list. Oh, well, that's, that takes me back to when I was 10 years old, Mike. <laughs> oh, you <go. laughs> Thank Good. you very much. I look forward to that. Thank you. You stay healthy, sir. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.